Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, because Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. He got there and he miraculously raised him from the dead. He'd been dead for four days. It's like somebody going down to the uh, local uh, mortuary and then saying to the mortuary, where's the assistant, where's the body? And saying, well, the body's in the cooler cabinet. And he just walks in and he opens it up. He doesn't even open it up, the door opens. And he just says, this person is alive uh, once again. And all the family, the grieving family, and all the... Uh, mourning party, they would hire mourners. Uh, this was quite an affluent family, so <coughs> the Jews were there, the, uh, uh, the high society of the Jews were there, and even uh, some of the Pharisees were there too. And they saw what went on. He tells us in verse 5 that some believed that they thought, yes, this, this is quite, who else can raise the dead? And they believed. But others, from verse 46, tells us that they went off to the Pharisees who went on and gathered the council of the Sanhedrin and they spoke about these things. And so here we are now, taken as it were, behind enemy lines. Those who are against Jesus. And believe you me, there are always those who are for Jesus and there always will be those who are against him. Always. Here we go, John chapter 11, verses 45 to 57. Many of the Jews, therefore, had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. So wonderful. They went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. That's why I'm saying we're behind the enemy lines here. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews but went from there to, to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many of them went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves, looking for Jesus. And saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? That he will not come up to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them so that they might arrest him. Oh, Amen. Well, may God give us understanding of that passage and bless us uh, with it to our hearts. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy and infallible word. We thank you, Lord, for its inspiration. We thank you, Lord, that it is your word which is God. Not the thought processes of men, but you, God, breathed it out through men and inspired them to write your word. It is inerrant without error in all areas. And Lord, we pray that we may submit all areas of our... We pray, Lord, now that the Holy Spirit may speak through uh, myself as your servant and submit to it. We pray, Lord, that you would speak and give us ears to hear, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So behind the lines, and we were taken uh, behind to see exactly uh, what is going on here. It's like being a, a fly on a wall. It's as if Jesus has gone before us. He's gone behind those other lines, but he's got a hidden camera on. He's got a microphone on, so we can hear the discourse. We can hear exactly what is going on. Jesus has revealed it to us and we, know we can see it for ourselves. And there's a number of lessons that we, we, that we can see here. 
the first one is quite startling, really, that we learn is that even after the miracle itself, we see the unbelief in the hearts of uh, certain people. Even after the miracle, the sign of the raising of Lazarus from the dead, even then, people still do not believe. And it's not the first time, of course. Matthew 13, 58, Mark 6, 6. There's all areas where Jesus does miracles and signs, and yet the people are filled uh, with unbelief. And unbelief to Jesus' ministry and his miracles and his sign and wonders is found littered throughout his ministry. There are others, of course, who come to believe through these uh, signs and wonders which are signs or flares pointing to his Messiah and his reign and his power and authority. But there are others who don't believe, who are still dead in their trespasses and sins. They are spiritually dead, even after spectacular miracles. Rather than coming to faith, they run back to the Pharisees with the news that, that what is happening, they say exactly, they know they're not denying the miracle. They're not denying that Lazarus has been raised from the dead. They're saying that he has. They never denied it. But they never denied the miracles of Jesus, not even his enemies. But yet they are filled with unbelief. I find it staggering. Don't you? Turn with me to John chapter 12. And, and just, just over the page. John chapter 12 and verses 36 to 43. And Jesus talks about the unbelief of the people. It says, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them, and though he had done so many signs, he had done so many signs, a peripheral he had done sign after sign, wonder after wonder, cast out demons, gave sight to the blind, fed the hungry, a few loaves and a few fish, raised the dead, changed water into wine, he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what we heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of them. He goes on to say, nevertheless, many even of the authorities did believe in him, but for the fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. You notice, here's some believed him, but they did not confess it. They blended in with the Pharisees still. So why? They didn't want to be seen. They did not want to be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man, more the glory that comes from God. What we see here is the hardness of the human heart. How hard the heart really is. Because even signs and wonders is not going to make any difference to the human heart. Signs and wonders do not save people. Signs and wonders, it's, that's not what saves people. It's the gospel that saves people. It's Christ's death and resurrection that saves people. Signs and wonders might lead people to believe in Christ and in the, uh, of Christ and his, his atoning sacrifice, but they in themselves are not what saves people. They in themselves cannot change a hard heart. Many people think if I see some miracle or some miracles, then I and others would believe. You're deluded. Listen to what Jesus says, a true story, doesn't he? In Luke chapter 16, he talk, tells a story. It's not a parable. He tells a story because a parable never mentions names. And in this story, and Lazarus, and Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham in heaven, and the rich man is in the torments of hell. And the rich man desires to tell his family to come to this place, to, to listen to the prophets, and to listen to Moses. 
And Jesus says at the end, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone should rise from the dead. Jesus rose many people from the dead. So that's exactly what happened. And Jesus himself was his own death and resurrection is the sign, is the whereby, the means, the greatest miracle of all, whereby people are saved by believing in his death and resurrection, by coming to that place of faith. And that has happened. <coughs> and people still are in unbelief. And it just shows the deadness, the hardness of the human heart. And that's what we see in these individuals. In many of them, they have a dead heart. And that is where we all were, by nature, as children, as objects of wrath. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us in verse 1, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And it is not until the Spirit of God comes and fills new birth. Ephesians 2 5 tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But it goes on and says, but God, by his Spirit, makes us alive. You know, this idea is somehow that we can respond, that we have the ability to respond to death. <coughs> the only reason that we can have the, respect, uh, the ability to respond to God is because God, in his grace and his mercy, goes beforehand and gives us that ability to respond to him and to acknowledge him. Because the human heart is dead, a dead body cannot be raised unless it is spoken with divine life into it. And so it is a spiritually dead heart cannot be brought to life. You see, in chapter 12 of that passage that we read, we see both this human responsibility, notice that in verse uh, 37 of chapter 12, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. <coughs> so the human responsibility there, they did not. And then in verse 40, we see the God's sovereignty in all of this. Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. You see, we are born with hardened hearts towards God. It's ineffable, the sovereignty of God, and the electing love of God and human responsibility. They're both there. But human minds cannot, we think they cannot, it cannot be. But in the sovereign purposes of God, it can be. And it is, and we'll all become clear on, on, on his presence when we're made perfect. But also, not only is this heart filled with unbelief, not only is this heart a dead heart that needs to be made alive by the Spirit of God, which the Spirit of God brings conviction, conversion, and the new creation. Anybody in Christ is a new creation. Ezekiel tells us that it is God who takes out the heart of stone, puts a heart of flesh in, in us. This is what the human soul needs. It's not miracles alone that it needs. It needs the Spirit of God to be born again. People need a new birth. Have you received a new heart of God? Have you received it? Or is your heart still hard? Are you still filled with unbelief? Maybe you, 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 you believe in God like these who were in the synagogues and there, but they liked the glory that came from man. Second heart, not only is it a, a heart filled with unbelief, but it's a poisoned heart, isn't it? A poisoned heart, verse 48 uh, of, of chapter 11. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. <clears throat> we can't let him go on like this. If he goes on like this, we've had it. He's going to take away our place. Our power, our nation, our temple, it's all going to be lost. We're going to lose our influence. And people are going to believe in him. And then in verse 53, here we see the real poison of their heart. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Here's a heart that they believe they're religious people. They are worshippers of God. And yet here they are plotting and scheming to do away with Jesus. 
The heart is poisoned against him. And it's a poisoned heart. See, it's poisoned because they don't want them to lose their power. He's undermining their authority. He's in their position and their traditions. They want to keep their traditions. They want to keep their positions. They were fearful of the result of the Romans who would take away their place, their temple, and their nation. But the whole thing is so ironic because what was said, and, and even maybe prophetic, because it was their unbelief of Jesus as Messiah, not their belief, which would cause them to lose their temple, which would cause the, the loss of the nation to be taken away in 70 AD, when the Roman powers came upon that place and ransacked Jerusalem. And they destroyed the temple at 70 AD, as Jesus prophesied would happen. And, and they reversed as a Jewish nation, and they lost. They were no longer a nation. And so it's ironic, the very thing that they were trying to hold on to, they lost because of unbelief. Their hearts were poisoned. Hearts were poisoned against Jesus. On the surface it might seem a justifiable reason. Because there were other messiahs, proposed messiahs and saviours who would come. But for all their kingdoms were of earthly rule. All they tried to do was overthrow the powers that be. It all ended in bloodshed and death. But Jesus' kingdom was not a kingdom of the sword, but a kingdom of the heart. Whereby he enters into human hearts. Until he comes again and reigns upon this earth and will be a kingdom. When he rules by power. But Jeremiah speaks about this poisoned heart. The prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 17.9 tells us that the heart is deceitful. It tells lies. Above all things and desperately sick. And who can know who know it and it? And I find my heart doing that. Don't you? Your heart being deceitful. Jesus states that out of the heart comes evil thoughts. This is what he Murder. These evil thoughts that they have lead to murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. Some of the very vices which would fall out of their hearts against Jesus, Jesus speaks of here, is what comes out of the heart. Our hearts are poisoned. As Mr. Alan Hayes was saying, now, intrinsically, he was speaking that we're good. And he denies all concept of the a doctrine of original sin. But the Bible says that we are by nature sinners. That's good. By the Spirit of God and by Jesus. But isn't it true today that poisoned heart is seen so often all around us in the world? People seeking power, want to hold on to things. In the Middle East it's prevalent, isn't it? Iraq with Saddam Hussein, holding on to power. Libya with Colonel Gaddafi. Syria with al Asha. Also in the communist countries, not just run countries present and past like North Korea. With Kim Jong Un, the Soviet Union under Stalin, China under Mao Zedong, Germany and Adolf Hitler. We see the poison of the human heart outwardly manifested in all these places. With dictatorship, oppression of the people, genocide, while a select few hold on to the vestiges of power. It's because they've got a poisoned heart. Even under the religious institution, this poison can reveal its ugly head. Jesus himself here is quoting Isaiah to these people. And he says in Matthew 15 verse 8, he says, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In doctrines of doctrines of men. And he's speaking to his own Jewish countrymen. Consider the Catholic Church which has undertook the Crusades, the persecutions faced by ordinary people during the Reformation throughout Europe, converting to the Protestant faith whereas they came to realise justification through faith alone, through Christ alone, not through the Church. Under the reign of Queen Mary in our own country, Protestant believers in this country burnt at the stake. 
in the guise of religion. Today, the rise of fundamental Islam is spread throughout the Middle East. Africa, Nigeria at this present time, other churches being destroyed and bombed. India spreading even throughout Europe. Even on our own shores, we have British Jihai bombers blowing up the tube stations in London. British-born citizens in the name of religion. Okay? The religious person has got a poisoned heart. It would be devastation. What do we do? How do we cope with this? Consider the rise of militant atheism and humanism in places of influence today. Government media in the guise of equality and tolerance seeking to eliminate any traces of Christianity out of the public life of society. So even today, <coughs> Think about euthanasia, abortion, the Coalition for Marriage. This is the subject I right? signed the petition, the Coalition for Marriage. They want to change the name of marriage. The institution that God has established and set up marriage. One man and one woman. And this is the society that we're living in. It's a godless society. What are we to do? Well, Jesus taught our weapons are not weapons of poison of violence, but they are weapons of love and wisdom. And we have to stand, like Jesus, stand before people. Jesus said, love our enemies. To love our enemies. To pray for those who persecute you. In Romans it tells us, do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Beware of a dead and poisoned heart. It will seek out to overthrow the reign of Christ. The reign and lordship of Christ, it will overthrow. And it will undermine. They, the religious people, will be the power base. They will hold the strings. They will be the ones in authority. Not Jesus. He won't be Lord. They will be the lords. People will start to bow down to the institutions. And not to Christ. And then secondly, we see, if we see the problem of the heart, we see secondly the purpose of the declaration of Caiaphas. You notice that in verse 49 to 52, the purpose of Caiaphas' declaration here, declaration. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest for that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand it is better for you that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on his own, of his own accord. But being high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also gathering to one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. What a wonderful statement. Here is a prophetic, a prophetic Word from the Lord. And what is amazing that God does it through a godless man. That God speaks through this God forsaken man into this meeting of the Sanhedrin. You see, Caiaphas was the high priest. He was a Sadducee. He was the longest serving priest of his generation. He served from AD 18 to AD 36. And as a Sadducee, they were known for their arrogance above the Pharisees. You see, you, see, you get a picture of his, his arrogance before uh, the Pharisees in there. The Sanhedrin was a council of 71 leaders of uh, Sadducees and Pharisees. They had different doctrines. But here we see them coming together. People of different persuasions coming together to eradicate Jesus. And that's what we'll see. You'll see religions coming together. You'll see authorities coming together to eradicate and persecute real, genuine Christians. Taking away the lordship of Jesus. But here we see, look at his arrogance before them. He says, but one of them who was high priest that year, verse 49, said to him, you know nothing at all. You know nothing at all. They're, 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 what they're thinking about in their hearts. 
He knows what it's all about. You know nothing of all. Caiaphas here has got an evil intent. His evil intent in his declaration. His arrogance. He thinks that the, that the party, how foolish they are. Maybe they were like, like Nicodemus. Of course, Nicodemus was part of the Sanhedrin. He came to faith in Jesus. And maybe in some way he was putting forward a case for Jesus for, to, to protect him, to, to, to watch over him. And, and they were just like, it was like a, a talking shop. And Caiaphas says, let's just cut to the chase here. You, you know nothing at all. Others were just airing uh, their views. But Caiaphas is here, is airing and he's speaking out loud what others thought in their hearts maybe. But they feared to say it out loud. He unashamedly cries out, you don't understand, it is better for you. Not just that, better for you. That one man should die for the people and the whole nation perish. It's better for you, he's saying, if we shut this man up. We can go on as a nation. You can retain, we can retain our uh, place of worship. We can retain our power base. And Jesus is condemned here. And it's for the public benefit. And that's true for Christianity today. In the public life of the UK. To keep Christianity, to keep morality, the commandments of God, the purposes of God, out of the nation completely. It's for the public benefit of all in society. Euthanasia being pushed, civil partnerships, marriage, curtail of freedom of speech, the erosion of family life. It's under the guise of the public benefit of the majority of people. This is what the majority wants. Rather than being tolerant of one another, it is an intolerance being shown towards other people who have different views. Whereas Jesus says we need to be tolerant of one another. We need to accept one another. And here's the evil intent. And it's in the guise of equality and in the guise of tolerance, but it has an evil intent. But we're not to lose hope, brothers and sisters. Because at the blackest points, at the darkest hour, God is about to start and do the most profoundest work of all, despite man's evil intent. And that's why I'm filled with hope. And the more that the devil pushes his work, the gospel is going to shine through all the more. All the more. Notice, yes, Caiaphas thinks he knows. And he speaks about one man dying for the nation. And to save the nation. And he thinks that he knows why he wants to do that. But it's a double meaning it. Because John tells us that this word, he didn't just say it on his own accord. God spoke it. It was prophetic. It was a word from the Lord. It was a word from God. And he was saying that all this foretelling that he's speaking of is in accordance with the, the scriptures. Verses 51 and 52 is in accordance with the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, his substitution of atonement. One man should die for the nation, yes. And not only the nation, but for, for all the children of God. <coughs> For the inclusion of the Gentiles as well, tells, John tells us. And the whole of scriptures is filled with prophecy after prophecy, pointing to this one man dying to save the nation, not only the nation, but a whole group of people from every tribe and nation and people group. Psalm 212 tells us that the leaders and the nations conspire, they plot against him. That's what's going on. And they plot in vain. And even today, nations and leaders who are anti-Christ plot against Christ. They've got a hard heart. They've got a poisoned heart. They're filled with unbelief. They do not know. But this is what they do. They plot against the Lord's anointed. And the Lord laughs in heaven. It tells us in Psalm 2. Psalm 22, verse 16, it tells us, King David tells us, that the crucifixion of Jesus, that his hands and his feet would be pierced on our behalf, that he would be crucified. 
Isaiah and Isaiah 53 give us that graphic rejection, that graphic picture of Jesus being the atoning sacrifice for us. That he was despised and rejected by men, and like a lamb to the slaughter, he was led to his death. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. But the Lord prolonged his days, and he raised him from the dead. All these prophecies spoken hundreds, if not thousands, a thousand years before the very fulfillment of these things taking place. And then Psalm 110, it tells us of the exalted Christ. My Lord says to my Lord says to his Lord, sit at my right hand while I make my enemies its footstool. Talks about his reign. That Jesus will reign. That all his enemies, that all that fight against him, all that have evil attempts <coughs> against the Lord Jesus will be submitted, will be humbled. And all those that are humbled before him and acknowledge him will be exalted. And so there's that evil intent in this declaration, but there's that prophetic declaration with God's sovereignty, that God is at work, that God is ruling, that God is working his purposes out. And so in the midst of terrible times, we need not fear. For God is in control. So once again we see here man's evil intent being overruled by God's own sovereign will. To bring about his purposes. We see the early disciples proclaim this truth. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2.23 Then Jesus delivered up to a court. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You see that? You killed him by the hands of lawless men, but God did live him up in the foreknowledge of God to do this. Then he goes on in verse 36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, God has made him Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. You see that? The evil intent which God's sovereign will and purposes, that God is working out his purpose. And so even with all the intent of God's forsakenness and God's in this nation today, God is working out his purposes. And he's going to bring his glory from him. And that's just wonderful. Finally, the last point here. We see the perversity, the problem of the heart, the perversity of the outward religious form here. We've already seen the poison heart of these religious people. But the outward perversity of it. Uh, verses 54 to 57. <coughs> Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know that they might arrest him. So these very people with the poisoned hearts, these very people are now taking part in a religious ceremony. <laughs> They're actually being cleansed from their sins. They're going through the pure the traditions of their Jewish religion to be before they take partake in the Passover uh, ceremony. And so here we see that these individuals, the perversity of the ritual, that they are looked the part, that they are driven by forms and ceremonies. They're driven by forms and ceremonies. They're following the outward observances Yet within their hearts, all the while, seeking the downfall. They're going through these religious duties, but yet they're looking, will Jesus turn up? Will we be able to grass him up to the authorities? And I bet they're doing these religious things. It's hypocritical, isn't it? It's hypocritical. And that's what's happening. They're doing this here. And Jesus give the religious hypocrites seven woes. They don't practice what they preach in Matthew 23. You can read it there, verses Matthew 23, right through to 36. The religious hypocrisy. They don't practice what they preach, he says. 
He tells us that they burden others with rules, but they themselves don't practice them. And they do deeds. Their good deeds are done to be seen, to be looked at, and part, and to be acknowledged. They are lost. And they are follow and they followers of lost go to great lengths to follow them. Yet they're hellbound, says Jesus. They rewrite the law book and they make their own rules. The smallest details have become so important to the law and they've lost its original intent. The outside of the appearance is clean, but inside it's rotten. They consider themselves better than other people. But somehow, I'm better. I'm not sinful. But we're all sins. We're all rotten to the core. Notice this form of religion satisfies, it satisfies the flesh. In Colossians 2, uh, 23, it satisfies our flesh, this form of religion. Going through ceremonies, doing uh, the traditions. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom, says Paul. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and serenity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh, he says. Jesus said, Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Our hearts are desperately wicked. How are we to get a pure heart? How are we to receive a pure heart? Only through the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Only through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not through forms and ceremonies. Not, not, not through going to church. Not, not, not through baptism in the waters. Not through being christened. We don't, we don't get a pure heart from that. Oh, going on marches with flags and banners. We, we don't get right with God through that. Or going on a Lent course. We don't get right through God through that. We get right with God from repentance and faith. It's a pseudo-religion. It seeks to take others with it. It's no good being godly on a Sunday and being godless Monday to Saturday. Is it? It's no good being godly on a Sunday, coming to church, getting your fix, and Monday to Saturday, ignoring what God says to us in his word. We have to walk the walk. We have to live the life. Forms and ceremonies don't save anybody. It is the gospel of Christ. Outward religious forms and ceremonies will save no one. And these people have, they're there, they're there. They're there at all the big ceremonies, all the big guys, they're there. They're doing it. But are they telling people about Christ? That they need to save them from hell? That they're sinners? They need to get right with God? Or do they just think they're good enough? And God's just going to save everybody anyway. And it doesn't really matter. Because that's not the case, is it? The perversity of outward religious people. And so there we are, we've been taken behind enemy lines. And you know what? We must love all people. We must speak to them in truth and in love. We must reach out to them. As Jesus did. But we mustn't ignore it. We mustn't bury our head in the sand. We must put our head up from the precipice. We too have an enemy. The devil. And Peter tells us that he prowls around like a roaring lion. Seeking who he may devour. An angel of light. But he's an angel of deception. Well may God give us understanding to his word. And may he spoke into our hearts. And may we really truly apply it to our lives today. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn, and I thought it was fitting. It's Isaac Watts, uh, 323, in this hour that we live in this day.